afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Katie Earl, and I'm the coordinator of the University Express program. We're joined here virtually today with Rhonda Hoffman from Central Library. Welcome, Rhonda. Hello. I'm excited to have Rhonda here today because even though I've seen her present before, I don't have the basics down. So I hope that we're all able to learn together in this engaging presentation. And we do have some new folks here today, so I'll quickly go through our housekeeping stuff. Uh, we are recording this session and I'll try to post it on our website at some point this week. So you can all take a look at that and tell your friends about it. You've joined muted and without your video showing, and that's not because you've done anything wrong. It's just the settings for our program here today. And there are other people on with us. You just think you're the only one, but I promise you you're not. It's just our anonymous participation mode. So as Rhonda goes through her presentation, please feel free to type in your questions and comments in the Q&A panel. If you're new to us, you'll find that in the lower right-hand side of your computer screen. You'll see the box with the question mark. Or if you're on a smartphone or tablet, poke or touch your screen, that'll bring up your control panel. Then you'll be able to find your Q&A panel from there. So we hope you have some fun with us today. We'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, my Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all of their support. And as always, please don't hesitate to contact us at Senior Services or at 858-8526. Now let's learn about Rhonda. Rhonda Hoffman is the genealogy specialist at Central Library in downtown Buffalo. She is a Master of Library Science from the University of Buffalo and a Bachelor of Arts in History from SUNY Geneseo. Rhonda has been researching her own family history for over two decades and has served on the board of the Western New York Genealogical Society since 2011. She is currently the editor of the Society's Quarterly Journal. Rhonda volunteers for Search Angels, an organization that helps adoptees find their biological families using DNA testing and traditional genealogy research. Rhonda, we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. It's great to be here. I always appreciate being invited by, by you to speak. Um, so we mentioned that I was I work at a place called the Grosvenor Room. The Grosvenor Room is in the Central Library. It's open the same hours as the rest of the library. It's our special collections department. You don't need a, an appointment or anything to come visit us unless you want to view a rare book, which if you're doing genealogy research, usually you wouldn't have to do that. But we have genealogy, local history, maps, music scores, and rare books. We're named after a gentleman named Seth Grosvenor who was here from a little bit before the War of 1812 until a little bit after the War of 1812. And he was important in the rebuilding of Buffalo when it was burned during the war. He, when he died, um, he had moved to New York City, but he kept ties with the city of Buffalo. So when he died, he bequeathed $40,000 to the city of Buffalo to build a public reference library, which some of you might remember, it was called the Grosvenor Library. And the library, various library systems merged in the 1960s and the Grosvenor Library was closed, but it had had one of the largest genealogy collections in the country. And we got their materials. So that is why we're named the Grosvenor Room because those materials form the basis for our collection. So let's start talking about getting started in genealogy. Genealogy research is researching your family members, researching events that happened in their lives, and determining who your ancestors are through your research. It's all about records. Records could be anything that mentions one of your ancestors, from census records to vital records to newspapers, photographs, funeral cards, anything that mentions your ancestor. To get started, you want to learn about records, which is what we're going to do today. But there are a few sources that I recommend. One is called The Source, a Guidebook to American Genealogy. And that includes many different topics. Um, it usually goes into different record types, like military records, vital records, different ethnic groups. It is online for free as a wiki, and that will be on your handout. And then there's another book called the Red Book, American State, County, and Town Sources, 
That's a handy reference book if you want to learn about what genealogy records are available state by state through the United States. That is also available online for free as a wiki. And if you have New York state roots, the book that's pictured here, New York Family History Research Guide and Gazetteer, is a great book to start out with. It talks about the different record types available for New York State, and then it goes county by county and talks about the different records available in the different counties. If you ever wanted to have a look at that book, we do have a copy in the Grosvenor Room that you could come and view. You want to start out by writing down what is known because Memories can be lost in an instant, and that memory that was just lost could be the key to solving a piece of your genealogy puzzle. So you want to write down what you know, and you want to ask your relatives what they know. Different people might have different pieces of information. One, maybe one of your relatives just asked more questions than other relatives. Names, locations, and time periods are key in genealogy research. So when you're talking to your relatives or you're writing down what you know, you want to make sure you write that information down. And that's because records are a main source of genealogical evidence, and the availability of records varies for different places and different time periods. So, for example, in North Carolina, Vital uh, marriage records start in the 1860s. They're kept at the county level and they're completely open so anyone can get a copy of those records all the way up till today. For New York State, we started keeping records in 1881. They're kept at the city or town level and you can also get a copy from the state. And there's a 50 year waiting period before we have access to marriage records for genealogy research. And sometimes we have to prove it. If it was a more recent time period and the persons who were married might still be living, we would have to prove that, that they are deceased in order to get a copy of the record. Sometimes those that time frame is waived if you can prove that you're a direct line descendant to the people whose marriage record that it is. You also want to ask your family members what records that they have already. Look, um, you know, look through your um, papers and see what you have, especially things that you might not find elsewhere. Things like funeral cards, letters, photos, scrapbooks, Bibles, diaries. And I always recommend that you make your interest known. So if someone is cleaning out their attic or basement and they come across some family papers that they don't want anymore, tell your family that you'll come and get them so that you can at least look through them for genealogical value before they are discarded, or maybe there's something that you'll want to keep. And collect contemporary documents now. So, you know, if you, you know, take photos of your family, um, do, you know, do newspaper clippings if there's something about one of your family members, collect those funeral cards, and you'll help future generations learn about their family's history that way. The more that I do genealogy research, the more I see how you really do become a detective. When we do our research, we will investigate clues about our ancestors, formulate theories as to who our ancestors are, and then we will find evidence to prove who our ancestors are. A clue in genealogy research could be an artifact found in home sources. For example, I went to visit my parents and I noticed my mom put something related to my grandfather on the wall that I'd never seen before. So this is it. It um, made me chuckle. It is a certificate called the Lucky Bastard Club. And this is something my grandpa got when he left the military during World War II. And it says, on this sixth day of June, 1944, the fickle finger of fate has traced on the rolls of the Lucky Bastard Club, Tech Sergeant Donald A. Fancher, engineer of the misfortune, who on this date achieved the remarkable record of having sallied forth and returned no fewer than 25 times 
bearing tons and tons of high explosive goodwill to the Fuhrer and would be Fuhrers through the courtesy of the 8th Bomber Company, who sponsors these programs in the interest of the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So, after I chuckled a bit, I, um, you know, started thinking about this document and it does give some great information, the plane that he was on and the 8th Bomber Company. But what really struck me was the date at the top, the 6th day of June, 1944. And some of you might recognize that as D-Day. So I thought, oh my goodness, could my grandpa have been at D-Day? So I asked my mother if she had any more documents related to his military service. Um, obviously this is him pictured here and this is my grandma down at the bottom. So she did, it turns out that she did have more military documents. And this is a list of all of the different missions that he flew on. He flew on 30 different missions. It lists the dates and then it lists where they took place and how many hours that he was in the air. So the very last mission that he flew on was on D-Day. And you can see it gives the date and French coast, and he was in the air for eight hours and 35 minutes. So it gave me a great sense of pride. My grandpa was an engineer, but he was also a top turret gunfighter. So this is what kind of thing, what he did. And we found my mom had some newspaper clippings too. And it said that on D-Day, he was um, a top turret gunfighter. Another thing that could be a clue in genealogy research is family lore or memory. So I asked my dad about his grandfather. So my great grandfather, his name was Stephen Hoffman. And he said that, my dad said that he came to the US to escape German military service and that Stephen used an assumed name Stephen Polson when traveling to the US and that he was from Germany. So that was really important to my research because I had been looking for the family in census records and I knew the family as Stephen Hoffman. There's his wife, Agnes, and this is my grandpa, Felix. And this is where they live, 29 Pangolin Street. This is in Dunkirk, New York, and it lists some of the different children. But there were some years that I couldn't find the family in census records. So knowing that he came to the US under Polson, um, it helped me find some of those records. So this is the 1940 census and you can see the family is listed under Stephen Polson. You can see they're at the same address, 29 Pangolin Street, and it's got some of the same children's names here. Another thing that could be a clue is, are the clues that you find in the records themselves. So here's my Stephen Polson family. And this column right here, is marital status. And so for my great grandma Agnes, it says M1, M means that she was married, but for Stephen, it said M2. So I wondered, is it possible Stephen was married twice? What is that? What are those numbers for? And if you go online, you can easily just do a search in your browser for census instructions put the census year in there and you can read what the census takers were supposed to write down. So it says for married persons inquire whether they have been married before. And if this is the first marriage, write M1. But if this is the second or subsequent marriage, write M2, meaning married more than once. So I hadn't heard about Stephen being married twice. So I asked my relatives, was Stephen married twice? And they said, no. And I looked in the New York State marriage record, but I marriage index, but I couldn't find a marriage, another marriage for Stephen. Um, I tried to look for a marriage record for him to my great grandma, which sometimes might list a previous spouse or an indication of another marriage. Um, but there was no record. There was no, actually no civil marriage record for him getting married to my great grandma or any other marriage for him. And then I sought out a church marriage for Stephen to my great grandma, Agnes. And this is uh, from a Catholic church. You'll notice that it's in Latin, which some, sometimes that happens, especially in earlier uh, church records. 
like in the 1800s, they'll often be in Latin or the language of uh, the predominant ethnic group. And what this says is that Stephen, it lists him as Vidum, and then it lists Constante Mayerska. And then it lists a date here, January 9th, 93, Salamanca, New York. And what I came to find out um, with that Salamanca location, um, and I looked up what Vidum meant, which meant he was a widow. So I looked in Salamanca Catholic Church records, and I was able to verify that he was married to this Constance Myers, and she died on January 9th, 1893 in Salamanca. So he was in fact married twice. So you don't, we want to, don't take one record at face value. You might find conflicting evidence, um, or you might find lack of evidence, but, you know, keep, keep looking, make sure you check all sources that could tell you the information that you're looking for. Sometimes if you have conflicting evidence, you might have to look at the preponderance of evidence, what makes the most sense, what is repeated, you know, the most times. You want to look at the quality of the information source. So did your information come from, say, a vital record, or did you find something online that you're not sure where it came from? And sometimes you have to research indirect relatives to find information about your relatives. So if you're not finding something, say, where your great grandfather was born, but you know he had siblings, research the siblings and maybe you'll see where they were born and then maybe you could find records in that location about your direct ancestor. There's something called the genealogical proof standard. It teaches us how to do good genealogy research. It gives a lot of practical advice. One example is reasonably exhaustive research. So kind of what I did with my great grandfather, I didn't find what I was looking for a few places, but I kept trying. Another good thing to look at is something called a record selection table that we've put one of those together for the library. And you can get this on our website and there's a link to it in your handout. So it tells a different fact. Are you looking for somebody's birth date? First look in this column. So look in these records first, like vital records and church records. But if you don't find it there, then search the records that are over here and maybe you'll find it there. So that's a really good tool to have. So I wanted to go through my father's information bit by bit. So I looked at everything that he told me about my great grandfather, Stephen. And one of the things he said that what he was from Germany and all the different records that I had listed him as being from Germany. These are different census records. You can see Germany, Germany. His death certificate said he was from Germany. But then when I look at that church marriage record, it lists what looks like to me, Lipiori Posen Poznanski. So when we see ski, we think of Poland. So I'm like, hmm, is it really Poland and not Germany? So I looked up the history of Poland and Germany, and it turns out that Poland didn't exist as a country from 1795 through 1918. So this is the border of modern day Poland. And um, during this time frame, the country was split up between Prussia, which later became Germany, Austria, and then Russia. So it was Germany when my great grandpa lived there, and that's why it's not listed as Poland. So I wanted to try to prove it, and I looked at different baptismal records of Stephen's children, because oftentimes baptismal records will tell where the parents were born. So I kept seeing these various locations in church records. One of them is Pojno Posen, another Patulin Posen, and I went to the Polish Genealogical Society of New York State. The society is in the Buffalo area. They had all these great gazetteers, which listed Polish, the Polish towns, and then the way that Germans would say or named a Polish town. And I found a lot of similar things, but I wasn't quite finding what 
I thought was right. So I ended up taking a trip to Salt Lake City, which they have the family history library there, which is the largest genealogy library in the US. And I lucked out and that um, they had a specialist from Poland there. So I talked with her and I showed her all those records I had with the different locations on it. And she took one look at those locations and said, oh, that's not Lipiori, Hojno, and Patulin. It's Saipiori, Choina, and Patulin, all in the Posen area of Poland. So you can see Choina and Patulin are right near each other. And then Saipiori is not that far away. So it's common when you're researching your ancestors that they may not have told exactly where they were from. Maybe they'll tell the exact town they were born in, or maybe they'll tell where they were baptized or where the vital records are kept, like what is the county seat, that kind of thing. Or maybe they'll tell the, the closest larger town or the most recognizable town. So you have to take those things into consideration. So my new goal was to find the Hoffman family in Polish church records. And I was at the largest genealogy library on, in the country. And so I thought maybe they have the Polish records here. And in fact, they did have the records and they were under Choina, the German way to say this town. The records were in German. Um, and before I got started with my search, before you start searching, you should always review what you've already obtained about that person so you can easily recognize them in records. Because you, you will see repeat names and even people who have a very similar birth date. So you wanna make sure that you can best identify them, that you have the right person. So I knew he was born on December 16th, 1860. His birth name was Stephen Hoffman, his alias was Stephen Polson, and his parents were John Hoffman and Ann Krieger. So I looked through those records and I found in 1859 instead of 1860, someone who was born on December 16th in Patulin. This, it lists him as Stephenus Blasius. So this is actually in Latin and his parents Johannes for John Polson and Anna Lizak. So I was a bit confused because supposedly his true name was Hoffman, but here I found someone named Polson who had this about the same birth date. So I had to analyze what I found and look at the pros and cons. And um, so I looked all over this microfilm from 1840 to 1900 and there were no Hoffmans with the December 16th birth date. I looked for the film on the other location, Saipiori, and there were no Polsons or Hoffmans at all for a 10 year period around when he was born. And I had to consider would he have listed false information on American documents to go along with his assumed name? Um, it seemed unlikely that he would tell false information in his church documents. One thing that conflicted was his mother's surname. The name Anna was right, but her name was supposed to be Krieger and not Lezak, but that came from Stephen's marriage record. So maybe she was remarried by them, or maybe Lezak was a first marriage last name and he wrote that down and that was written down for some reason. And I tried to find a marriage record for the parents, but I couldn't find anything. I wondered, Blasius, the middle name, did that help identify Stephen? And I looked through all of the documents that I had on Stephen for the United States, but there was no middle name listed or even a middle initial to help corroborate. And I had to consider that the birth day is correct, but the birth year, it was off by one year, according to his death certificate. But in information from death certificates is not that reliable. Um, because the data comes from someone else, obviously. So it all depends on if the person giving the information knows the correct information. And the information was from his son, but it was, he died at the end of the year. He died in December. So sometimes that can be confusing. If you're thinking, oh, he was this age, so this must be the year he was born. Um, so the math could have been done incorrectly. Or, you know, people, 
birth dates weren't as important back then. So he might have just rounded up, oh, I was born in 1860 instead of saying 1859. But something else that corroborated um, the birth year of 1859 was that seven out of nine of his census records support 1859 as the birth year instead of 1860. So I wasn't really sure what was true, but now we have DNA. So I had my dad take a Y DNA test, which is the DNA only inherited by males from their father. It follows the direct line. So this should have told me the Hoffman or Polson line, whatever the truth was. So in theory, um, the test the test will give you people matches. So in theory, um, I thought I would get a list of family members who were either I would either see a lot of people with the Hoffman last name or a lot of people with the Polson last name. But of course, things happen, name, name changes occur. Um, there could be misattributed parentage. So, you know, someone could have had an affair or there could have been an adoption. And did, did the right people even test? Will I even get any hits for my dad? So he took the test and he got a number of matches. He got tons of matches really, but a lot of them were very distant matches. The closest to Hoffman was Heitman. There were a few names that were kind of close to Persian, um, to Polson. I got a Persian, Polchinski, Polson, and Poles. And the closest match, though, these tests will tell you different steps. You know, the more steps, the closer you are related to the person. So the this Polchinski person was the closest match. And so I contacted that person and he said, he had an immigrant ancestor come to the Bronx, Westchester County area of New York. So now I'm researching to see if the families connect. So we'll see, but I think my maiden name should be Polson instead of Hoffman. That's what I think. So when you're doing your research, you want to keep an open mind because things change, especially names. Uh, people go back and forth between their first name and middle name. Um, people might change the spellings of their last name. They may Americanize the last name to be totally different than what they were born as. Um, and when you're interviewing your relatives, just keep in mind that the things people remember, it's, you know, it's based on their life experiences, their perception at the time, at the time. So, like, if someone was a child, when something happened, they might not have understood what was really going on. Whereas if you ask an adult who saw the same thing, they might say something different. So keep those things in mind. Um, family stories may, may or may not be correct. Usually there's some truth to the stories, but you'll find that they're not fully accurate. Any type of record could contain errors. You know, clerks, the people who write down the information are all human, so you, they might write down the wrong thing. And sometimes you'll run into a case where records were damaged or destroyed and you can't get access to them anymore. Remember to use other people's research as clues. So you're looking at those online family trees. Look at the trees, see if they have documents to back up their research connected to the trees. Um, if they don't, just see, look at the information they put, use them in clues, and see if you can prove those same things through documentation. So people always ask me, where should I start? And it's just your own choice. Pick the family line that you're most interested in or pick the person you're most interested. But you want to start with the present and work backwards one generation at a time. You want to review what you already know and what your relatives have told you. You can look at, you know, look at all these facts and then where are there gaps in this information and then look at the record types that could help you fill in the particular gap. So I just made up an ancestor, John Smith. Maybe he, you know, he died in the 1960s, but you don't know an exact date. So you could look into death records. Um, maybe you don't know who his parents are, so you could try to get, you know, birth certificates, marriage certificates that might give that information. And then you just assess what records should be available for the location and time period that your ancestor was living and when a certain event took place. 
And a good place to do that is by looking at that red book that I told you about, which will be in your handout. And look at the record selection I told you about, which that'll be in your handout. So let's start talking about the records we use for genealogy research. There's a few online sources that I'd like to tell you about because I'll refer to them many times throughout the presentation. One of them is Ancestry Library Edition, which is an online subscription service for libraries. It's almost the same thing as Ancestry.com. It includes both the US and foreign content of Ancestry. It's available at every Buffalo and Erie County Public Library location, so you could go to any one of our locations and use it. And normally there's no at home access through the library, but because of COVID, they're allowing us to let our you know, library card holders use it from home. And I apologize, I didn't update this date. Um, they have now pushed the date that they're making it accessible from home through June of this year. And it could be extended further. They've been extending it for over a year now. There's also Heritage Quest Online. It's an online subscription database available to you from home with a library card or um, at every one of our location. And it includes things like census records and family and local history books and city directories and pension files and a lot of different records. And we're gonna talk about some of this. And then there's the free website, Family Search. Family Search is the website of the LDS Church. It's their genealogy website. They um, do genealogy research related to their religion, and they've collected records from all over the world. They used to microfilm records, and now they digitize records. And they're also trying to digitize all of the records that they have which are millions of reels of microfilm, and they're, they want to put them all online for everyone to access for free. Sometimes though, um, they have contracts with all of the different places where they got the records from. And sometimes those places don't want them to be online for everyone. So if something's not online, that's likely why. So if you see something and you're using family search and you look over to the right, you go under film and digital notes and you see this format here. And there's a little camera, you know that the records have been digitized, but if you see a key, it means that you can't use it from home. Um, and if you click on the key, it'll tell you where you can view that record. Sometimes it says family affiliate library. The Grosvenor Room is a family search affiliate library. So if it says that, you could come to the Grosvenor Room and either use your laptop with our wireless or use one of our computers and you could access that from the Grosvenor Room. Or you could visit one of the local family history centers, which are often in LDS churches. To my knowledge, they are not open at this time. There's one in Williamsville, Orchard Park and in the city of Buffalo. And I know they're looking to reopen, but as far as I know, as of today, they're not open right now. Um, if you'd like to get a good idea of what the library carries on our website, we have a number of guides and publications to our collections by all of these different topics that you see here from adoption to vital records to ethnic and immigrant groups. So you can look at these very detailed guides to see what we have. And through the presentation, you'll often hear me say, we have a guide about that. This is an example, our Irish genealogy guide. It'll have a nice table of contents. So you can see what page where you can find information about church records or passenger lists, maps, analysis. And then say you're looking at the church and cemetery records. You can see all the different records that we have and we put a lot of detail, like exactly what years do we have for different baptisms and marriages and deaths. So the first record type that I'll talk about are city directories. And these are really 
helpful. They're very similar to telephone books. You can look up somebody's name and see where they lived. Um, usually it was only the head of household that was listed or adults who worked outside the home. And why I think these are so important are because they're available for a wide time frame. So for the city of Buffalo, we have them beginning in 1832 and they're still published today. But why they're important is because they help you locate your ancestor. And once you locate them, you know where to start looking for records. So they were here in Buffalo at this time period and this child was born during that time frame. So maybe there's a birth record for that child. So here you can see a sample listing. Um, this top one, Anna Beginska, um, she's the widow of Joseph and they lived at 157 Lopierre. Um, so what I like to do is look under a surname and see who else lived at that address because you know maybe you're going to see other relatives that way. So in the blue here, you can see both of those people lived at the same address on Sycamore with the yellow box stop area. Those two people both lived on Townsend Street at the same address in Buffalo. And then you'll see that, um, as I pointed out, if, if a woman is a widow, they'll usually list that and they'll put the deceased husband's name there. In the 1920s, I believe it was, it, if it would list the man and he was married, it would put they would put the wife's name in parentheses. And these really are a great guide to know where to look for records or what records might be available. So for example, if your ancestor died in a particular year and you want to say, oh, where could they be buried? What cemeteries even existed for this time frame? So there's a nice index in the beginning of these city directories. And like you can see, there's a section for cemeteries. So maybe he was buried at, in one of these cemeteries. Or if they were in asylum, what asylum, asylums existed? Or what churches or charities, um, orphan asylums, schools? The library has digitized numerous Buffalo directories from 1832 through 1913. And um, you can, you don't need a card or anything. You can go online for free at this website that's on your handout and you can search those. They're also available in Heritage Quest and Ancestry Library Edition from 1861 through 1960. Something that is in Ancestry and Heritage Quest is a great database to start searching if we're working from the present and working backwards. We usually start with death information. So this is a good way to find more modern death dates if you don't know that. It includes, um, it's called the Social Security Death Index and it includes deaths from 1935 through 2014. It's not complete. It, mostly starts in the 1960s to 2014. And it will list the person's name, their birth date. So this is a great source of a birth date, not just the death date, and then their last residence. So a lot of people are looking for an obituary. This is a way to find out their death date. So then you can go look up their obituary. There's also another social security database in Ancestry. And it's called the Social Security Applications and Claims Index. And if your ancestor is in here, it'll include even more detailed information most of the time. So here we have an Anna Bartosik. You can see she went by another name, Anna Gorgel. It gives her birth date, her place of birth, her death date, and it even gives her parents' names. Census records are probably the most popular records for genealogy research. And they're wonderful because they come out every 10 years. We have for genealogy research, census records from 1790 through 1940. There is a 72 year waiting period before they become available for genealogy research. So next year, the 1950 census will come out. So every, all the genealogists are really excited about that. Um, you should know that the 1890 census, most of it for the whole country was burned in fire. They were kept in a federal commerce building and they had a fire in 1921 and a lot of them burned. 
And you should also know that some states took extra census records. For New York State, we're really lucky because they took censuses every 10 years beginning 1825. Some of the years aren't quite on the 10 year mark, but we roughly have them between 1825 and 1925. So that helps us track our ancestors even more frequently. So what type of information can you learn from the census? The most detailed records are from 1850 through 1940. You can learn key personal and family data. So the censuses will list everyone who's living in a household together. So this is the Earl Stevens family and it lists his wife and all of his children. You can see their relationships to the head of household here. And down at the bottom, it lists his mother. You can see she has a different surname than him. It lists their gender, their ethnicity, their age, and um, their marital status. It will help you estimate important dates. So on this particular census, the 1930, it asks, how old were you at your first marriage? So for Earl, it says 22, for Viola, it is 16. So you could do the math and then you could determine an approximate date of marriage. Sometimes the, the censuses are very specific about young children under the age of five. So in this year, Lyman is listed as two years and 11 months old and Ada May one year and three months old. So if this was the time frame when you can't find a birth record for these people, now you have a better idea of when they were born. It gives other details about the individual's lives. So this is the Emory Livermore family, and it lists the, um, that he's a farmer. One of his um, daughters, Sophia, was a school teacher. It gives you the value of the real estate, the value of their personal estate. It tells the state or country that they were born in. It also gives you information for theory building. Here's my Stephen Hoffman uh, family again. And what's boxed off here, they asked for women, how many children are you the mother of? Or how many have you given birth to? And how many are still living? So five and five. But if you count up the number of children here, you'll see there's seven children. So this helps you formulate a theory. Oh, these all these children are listed as children of Stephen. So maybe these oldest children aren't Agnes's and they come from another wife. They also give you clues to find other records. So in this census, the 1920, it asks, um, do you own or rent your home? And is it free of a mortgage? So she, Josephine Barrick owns her home, it's free of a mortgage. So you would know, oh, maybe there's a deed, there should be a deed record for that. Um, it also lists this 1882 is the year she came to the US. It says NA means she was naturalized and 1885 is when she was naturalized. And then it tells that same information for some of the boarders who live with her as well. Speaking of naturalization records, the library has an index for Western New York naturalizations for all of these different counties that you see here for U.S. District Court naturalizations. There, you could have been naturalized at various courts. So there also could be naturalization records available through the county clerk's office. Um, but in this sample, you can see a Ben Hoffman. This is his um, declaration of intent number. This is the date. And then this refers to, refers to like a volume and page number. And so if you found someone in this index, you would then order a copy of this through the National Archives in New York City. Late 1906 forward naturalization records will likely list your ancestors' foreign place of birth. They created very detailed, detailed standardized forms beginning in that time frame. 
So I mentioned you may be able to get some of those from the county clerk's office. Um, Family search has a lot of naturalization records. Um, they have quite a few for Western New York. Ancestry has some for the New York City area and some other larger cities. The library has Canadian border crossing records for Buffalo, Lewiston, Rochester, and Niagara Falls on microfilm. This is also in Ancestry. So if your ancestor was coming from a foreign country and entering the US, whether it's to settle um, or you're a visitor, so you can see this is a visitor, um, you will be tracked coming into the US. So this includes a lot of great information. And this Anna Babbitts, it, you can see her maiden name is P-U-K. It lists specifically where she was born in Poland. It gives her age. Um, it gives her last place of um, foreign residence. Um, it lists that she's going to stay with her brother-in-law and it gives a specific address. Um, and um, it gives a physical description. So it, it includes a lot of great detail. Passenger lists, the library has many books that index passenger lists. Some of them are for specific ethnic groups, like we have a German set and one for Irish famine immigrants and an Italians to America set. Um, but the best place to start is using Ancestry Library Edition. They have passenger lists for all over the US, including, including some foreign and outgoing lists. So you could perhaps find your ancestor coming into the US, but also leaving from a foreign port. Newspapers, of course, are important for genealogy. So we all know about obituaries and marriage announcements and birth announcements. Um, adoptions are kept private now um, until someone is an adult and they could get their original birth certificate. But in the past, before adoptions became private, you might have even seen announcements in newspapers that somebody adopted a child. You might see things about divorces, name changes, property information, social activities, um, crimes, just anything that we see in the newspapers today. We have many different newspapers on microfilm in the Grosvenor Room. The earliest we have on film is 1818. Um, you'll more likely find um, Newspapers beginning in the 1840s for Buffalo that survived consistently, but we do have all of the Buffalo News and the Courier Express. We have some for specific ethnic groups like the Volksrund, which is German, and the Janique, which is Polish. And we have some for Erie County towns too. We have a guide on all of the newspapers that we have for Western New York. So it tells you the name of the newspaper, the years that we have. You might see facts about the newspaper, like this Age of Pro Progress was a spiritualist newspaper. And then it'll tell you where you can access those. You always come to the Grosvenor Room and they might be like, if it sees boxed, it's still in paper format that we could go get for you. RBR means a rare book room item, which you would have to make an appointment for. Or maybe you'll see that they're on microfilm. Heritage Quest has an obituary index. And um, this is actually an ancestry now too. So you can look up your ancestor's name to see if there was an obituary. Um, and you'll see different facts. Whatever might have been put in the obituary, you might see as a fact here. So you'll see things like their age, their birth date, death date, um, Maybe you might even see family member names. And um, down at the bottom, it tells you where they got that information from. So you can see the citation. So you can see Buffalo Courier, it gives the date. So then you could come and look at that on microfilm at the library. These are from newspapers.com. Newspapers.com doesn't have every newspaper. So just because you don't find someone in here, it doesn't mean there's not an obituary. There is a free website called FultonHistory.com that includes lots of newspapers for all over New York State. There are a number of 
Buffalo newspapers in here. So you can use this for free from home, Fulton History. There's also another free site called New York Historic Newspapers.org. This is where a lot of libraries are putting newspapers that they digitize. We have digitized some newspapers. Uh, we have the Buffalo Republic, which is an earlier Buffalo newspaper, the Criterion, which is an African American newspaper. Uh, there are some Lackawanna newspapers and Grand Island newspapers in here. There's also newspapers.com, which I mentioned earlier. It's a subscription website. The library does not subscribe to it. It's an ancestry.com product, but the Buffalo newspapers are available for use at the Buffalo History Museum. They only have access to the Buffalo newspapers on newspapers.com. We have something in the Grosvenor Room called the Local History File, which is a partial index to Buffalo newspapers, as well as other local periodicals. So it mainly covers the 1920s through 1982, and it focuses on Buffalo and Erie County, people, places, things, and history. So you could look up your ancestor's name and you might see a card and it might list some facts about that person. Like you can see when this person passed away and that he went to college at Yale. Then you might see these other numbers, which those are call numbers for our scrapbook collection. But if you see something and you're not sure what it is, just come and ask the librarians and we'll tell you where you can find that information. I mentioned that we have scrapbooks. We have about 400 different scrapbooks. They're mainly newspaper clippings. Um, we have a great, great big set called lo our local biography set. It's all about people. It starts in the early 1900s and goes up until about the 1970s. These scrapbooks, there are tons of topics. There's ones on ethnic groups and clubs and businesses and homes and churches. And we have a guide that you can look at. And these are partially indexed in the local history file, that card file that I just told you about. We have the New York State Vital Records Index. It's an index to New York State births, deaths, and marriages. It doesn't include New York City. They keep their things separate. And Buffalo, Albany, and Yonkers kept things a little different. So you have to go directly to those cities for marriages before 1908 and births and deaths before 1913. The microfilm isn't curly, currently being kept up to date because these indexes are now in ancestry. There are waiting periods before we can have access to these records for genealogy research. So there's a 75 year waiting period before we can have access to birth records um, and the person has to be deceased. And there's a 50 year waiting period before we can have access to death or marriage records. And for marriages, the people have to be deceased. So these indexes follow those same waiting periods. We do have some Buffalo birth records on microfilm from 1878 through 1913. There's no index to them, but they're roughly in order by date. Uh, Birth records are great. Obviously, you can learn the parents' names. Sometimes it will list the town where the parents were born. It will often list how many children the mother gave birth to and how many are still living. We also have some Erie County marriage records on microfilm from 1877 through 1935. I think marriage records are the best vital records because you're getting the information from the people who are getting married and they're very detailed. So they'll list the person's name, their ethnicity, their uh, place of residence, their age, their occupation, where they were born, their parents' names and where their parents were born. Um, and then we also have Buffalo Justice of Peace records from 1837 through 1876. We have Erie County Medical Examiner records. So these, um, they don't cover anyone, everyone who passed away. It's someone that died unexpectedly. So maybe there was an accident and they'll often list the person's name and age and place of birth, date and time of death, place of death, the cause of death, place of burial, a physical description, 
um, perhaps the undertaker's name or the belongings they had on them when they passed away. The example that I'm showing here is for President William McKinley when he was shot in Buffalo at the Pan American Exposition that was held in Buffalo. Um, so you can see it gives that same kind of information when he died and his cause of death. Church records, we have many church records at the library. These are a great source of birth, marriage, and death information. Um, these are usually kept earlier than what is kept for the state. And um, we have baptisms, marriages, deaths for many Catholic churches, many Lutheran churches, and some other denominations as well. Um, th this is a great source for finding a foreign place of birth. So if your ancestor got married in Buffalo and there's a church record, it will generally say where they were born. And if they had ch children baptized here, and they were from a foreign country, it would usually list where they were from in the foreign country, the parents where they were from. We have many different cemetery records. We have Forest Lawn, Mount Calvary Cemetery Group, Holy Cross, Lakeside Memorial in Hamburg. This is an example of a burial register for Forest Lawn Cemetery. So you might learn where they were born, where they died, their cause of death, their residence, and then it'll give you usually the undertaker's name, maybe the church where the funeral was held and where the location of the grave is. And with that information, if there was a family plot, it, you can often see a plot register. Um, and that'll list everyone who buried in that plot, usually the date of death or the date of burial. And sometimes in the remarks column, it will say, um, perhaps why they're buried here. So sometimes, you know, we look at these plots and you're like, who is that person? I don't know who that person is in my family plot. And maybe you'll see that it's an in-law or something like that. Or if they died out of the area, it might say um, their, um, where they died. We have many different local history books, um, which are great for learning the history of communities and churches and schools and businesses and it might include biographical information about your ancestor. The database Heritage Quest has many of those in it. This is an example for the town of North Collins. This shows um, early land buyers and when they bought the land and where it was located and the price and the acres. Here's some family information in the local history. Um, this is Job Southwick, and it tells where he was born, and he was born in the late 1700s. Um, it tells when he came to North Collins and information about his family. We have many family histories in the Grosvenor Room. We have about 5,000 family histories. You can learn just about anything um, usually it'll give birth, death, and marriage information and their spouse's name and children's names and where they lived and military information, any important accomplishments. There are many of these in Heritage Quest too. We have a pretty good yearbook collection for Erie County, especially high school yearbooks, especially, you know, from say the 20s into the 50s and 60s. We have some for 70s and 80s and 90s. We get these through donations. So if you have any Erie County yearbooks that you're looking to give to an organization, we do gladly accept them. We have partnerships with a couple of local organizations. One is the Western New York Genealogical Society. They have their library here in the Grosvenor Room. They have this great card file where you could look up an ancestor's name and you might find um, information about the ancestor and where they got this information from about your ancestor will be listed on the card and that source will be in their collection so we could help you find that. They have transcribed a number of Bible records that their members have so you can look through these Bible record transcriptions. They have lots of other resources. Some of the microfilm that we have is actually the Genealogical Society's microfilm. 
and we have, oops, we have the collection of the Polish Genealogical Society of New York State. It's very good for the Polish immigrant experience, Polish history and culture, church, church histories. We have some maps and atlases. Um, our earliest Erie County map is in the 1860s. Uh, it's in terms of maps that are very detailed. So this one is from the 1860s. And what it does is it shows where um, people bought property. So these are property owner names. And it also points out important businesses like a sawmill or hotels, brickyards, schools, churches, cemeteries. So a lot of Erie County towns didn't have their own city directories until the 18, 1950s or 60s or even later. So these are great city directory substitutes to help locate your ancestors for earlier time frame when there was no city directory. We also have Sanborn maps for the city of Buffalo, which are de very detailed property maps. You could see if, you know, if this was your ancestor's home, what was the building made of, how many stories it was. You can see it lists some public buildings like churches and schools. If you know where your ancestor worked, you might see a very detailed sketch of that business where the different departments are. If your ancestor was in a home, this is St. Vincent's Female Orphan Asylum, you might get an idea of what their life was like. You could see a map of the property with dormitories and the chapel and laundry and the school. We do have a database that you can use from home with your library card, digital Sanborn maps. We have these for the state of New York. These are in black and white and not color. Um, we do have some digital collections that you can use for free on our website. This is how you get to the city directories that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also have Erie County Poorhouse records from 1829 through 1952. Um, one of the things that you might see in these records, we have a number of intake registers. So if your ancestor was in the poorhouse, you might see their name and age, um, where they were born, their occupation, when they were in the home, where they were from, why they were in the home, and then their date of discharge. We also have some death registers. So these, you know, it's possible these may exist before we kept vital records. So you can see, you might find your ancestor's name, um, where they were born, their occupation, when they died, when they were buried, um, cause of death and then in the remarks column you might see where they were buried or who took the body usually it's a family member the last thing i'll mention is this great free website it's called cindy's list and it's a genealogy website that indexes other genealogy websites so if you're looking for online content for any pretty much any genealogy topic that you can think of, whether you're looking for information on a country or vital records or a different state, um, you might find what you're looking for here. My last words are that genealogy research is habit forming. You are not in this alone. The Grosvenor Room staff are there to help. So please come and visit our friendly and knowledgeable staff. Or if you go on our website, there's a way that you can contact us. You can send us a question. We can't do a lot of lookups for you, but we might be able to give you advice and tell you what we have that might help your genealogy research. That's everything that I have. Wow, Rhonda, thank you so much for walking us through all of that. Sure. Oh, what a wealth of information you and the library are. We have a lot of great stuff. It always, it still surprises me what I see that we have in our question, in our collection. We'll often stumble upon something and I'm just like, wow, we have that here. Um, librarians in the past really did a great job at collecting a lot of local documents. Sounds like it. Wow, so much for everyone to take advantage of. Yes. 
we love helping people. So don't feel shy about asking us questions. That we're, that's what we're there for. And, and speaking of that, I know we're a little over right now, but we have a couple questions. Is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. The first one is, um, I don't know what a wiki is. Is that on Wikipedia or a wiki? A wiki? A wiki. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I can't remember how I referenced a wiki. <laughs> a wiki is kind of like an encyclopedia that Anyone on the internet can edit it and put information in it. Um, I might have referenced the Family Search Wiki, which is a great resource um, that you can. It's another great resource to look for information other than Cindy's list. Um, you can look up just about any genealogy topic and um, find information on where to find records and that that type of thing. And I also, I also, I know I mentioned it for um, the Red Book. And for the source, those those beginner resources that I mentioned. So it's just a, a website um, that's kind of like an encyclopedia. But those particular books have been put all online in like HTML format. So it looks like a web page versus a book. But you get the same content that if you were looking at the book, you would you would get the same content. I hope that explained okay. it. I think that was a great explanation, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, I have several questions here about getting access to the handout that you referenced. So I will email that out to everybody when I get it. And for those of you who are calling in, you can give me a call at 858-7605 and I can put one in the mail to you. Uh, Rhonda, next question I'm seeing is, are men easier to find than women when starting to research? Unfortunately, yes. At least in the past, um, women are somewhat harder because they, you know, at least in our culture, they change their maiden names um, to their married name. So sometimes you know the married name, but you you don't know um, the maiden name. But also because you know in the past women didn't have as many rights as men, um, so they they might not have for a certain time frame been able to own property, you know, that type of thing or vote that and and um so oftentimes you have to search their male relatives to find them. So they can be more anonymous in records because they just didn't have as many transactions as men did. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question I'm seeing is is there a release delay on city directories like there is for the census? No, you can get them as soon as they're published. They're, they usually, we usually get ours in December and they're for the upcoming year. That's awesome to know. Thanks Rhonda. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just seeing, thank you Rhonda. It's amazing how much information is available. Thank you. This was an outstanding presentation. Hope this is recorded as I will need to watch this again. We are recording it. I will post it. And let's see. Are there records for re-entry into country by travelers is a question we have. You, you might see passenger lists. For sure, I've seen that. I find Americans coming back in from a foreign country. Um, as far as coming in through Canada or Mexico, the border crossing records, they don't list US citizens coming back into the country, but they, if someone did not naturalize, they do track resident, US resident aliens crossing the borders. Okay, hey, thanks, Rhonda. And those those you'll usually find in Ancestry. All right, that's great to know. Thank you. And then I'm just saying thank you. What a wealth of information. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, we appreciate you being on. Be on the lookout for an email from me in the near future. And Rhonda, as always, you are a pleasure. And we have you back for getting started with Italian genealogy on June 2nd at 2 p.m. 
And then we have you back for, I have my DNA genealogy test results. Now what? That's on June 17th at 2 p.m. So folks, you can register for that on our website at erie.gov slash University Express. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. All right, take care. Okay, bye.